thank you so much and uh, for that introduction again. I, I feel like we're doing like a mini um, mental health course uh, here uh, this week with, um, uh, with various topics kind of spanning the children's mental health area. And uh, it's been great for me. This is stuff really that I talk about almost every day with families. And so I hope that uh, you're able to learn something from it today as well. The problem with these lunchtime sessions is that I get to eat lunch. So I'm, I'm probably looking like skinnier and skinnier every, every day because I'm skipping lunch. But don't worry, I'll get some, I'll get some afterwards and I'll get re, re-energized. So again, thanks so much for joining today. Thanks for our sponsor today for the talk today. I'm actually at the, the new Community Health Hub uh, on Bayshore Drive here in Midland at Waypoint Outpatient Services that's located in there. It's a beautiful building. Unfortunately, the public, I don't think has enjoyed it as much as we normally would have at this point because of COVID restrictions. And really a lot of my care, 95%, I would say is all virtual. So we see a lot of families and kids just online or uh, with telephone calls, uh, just checking in and to see how patients are doing. So this morning was a, was a busy clinic again with, um, with a number of patients. Seems to be autism day today for some reason. I had a lot of patients this morning with, uh, with autism and we, we found out how they were doing and, and uh, some of them enjoying the online schooling and others uh, are actually going to school. Um, so it's been a it's been a really a really interesting morning, uh, and then other days seem to be ADHD days where we have a lot of kids with ADHD, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and you'll see some common threads I think run through each of these talks. You'll you'll hear a lot from me I think about just how careful we need to be about you know specific diagnoses in kids and how it is so important to look at the big picture and uh, not get too stuck in boxing in kids too much when they're developing and when they're young. I know it's tempting to do that. And sometimes to get certain resources at school or elsewhere, they need a specific diagnosis, but I don't want that to be limiting kids. And I also don't want um, kids to, you know, to feel like they are somehow, you know, stuck in that, in that in that diagnosis so um anyways just want to just want to clarify that um i i also i noticed that the um intros always talk about dr meter and colleagues now i'm the only pediatrician at waypoint right now we are looking to change that in the near future um but i do work with a lot of therapists and uh i i see uh marta's on our on our uh session today so Hi, Marta. She's one of our fabulous therapists over at the Georgian Bay Family Health Team, doing an amazing job with the families there. It's always so fun to work with Marta. She's got a great sense of humor, is always smiling. So thanks for, uh, thanks for joining me today. And maybe at the end, maybe she'll chime in with some comments herself. I told her not to ask me any hard questions. Okay, I am going to share my screen with you. Uh, make sure I share the right screen. And um, so you should... Now I'll be seeing um, my talk here called ADHD in Children and Youth. So um, ADHD is actually not something that's just obviously that we see in kids. We see it in all age groups. Of course, I deal primarily with children with this diagnosis. And, um, and so let's talk about that today. I, I thought I'd again just bring up a couple of cases of how, how these kind of kids might, might present to me. Of course, these are not their real names, but you know, there's so many Williams around, so there probably is a William H. A. Who, who might look like this in some classroom somewhere right now. But you know, in this case, it's an otherwise healthy boy who's currently in grade three, and um, that's often when these kids come to my attention. Is you know, grade three gets harder. I always talk to parents about that's when the the real learning starts to kick in. It's a lot, you know, play based in kindergarten, grade one, two, and in grade three, it just gets more difficult especially when it comes to reading. Um, you know, we, we learn to read in the first couple of grades, but then we read to learn after that. And, you know, we need reading to help us with science and math, it's word problems. Um, we need reading to help us just reading the instructions for questions in all areas of learning. And so if we don't know how to read, if we're struggling with reading, then um, it's gonna affect us in all areas. 
And reading is, is one skill that's particularly dependent on focus and attention. If you're reading, you're always reading a few words ahead of where you think you are and storing that in your working memory and then processing it and then making some sense out of it. I mean, it's no sense just reading words and not putting it into a big picture. And to do that, you have to remember what, you know, what you've read. So it's a very uh, attention requiring. I'm sure we've all read a book and gone through a page and not been focused and realizing I just read that whole page and I have no idea what I just read. So that's why focus and attention is really important. So this kid's in grade three. He's coming to the teacher's attention. He can't sit still in class. He's constantly moving, disrupting the other students. And um, as a result, because of that disruptive behavior, often gets sent to the office and academically he's falling behind. And so of course the parents get involved at that point as well and are made aware of the situation. And then his mom notes that even at home, he often gets into trouble and uh, doesn't seem to listen. Uh, he's known to be very, very active all the time as well. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next. So, so then, then here's another case. So this is an older child, age 14. So age 14 is typically when kids start grade nine. Um, so this is an otherwise healthy girl, some mild asthma, lots of kids have that. Um, but her parents separated recently and that's been hard on her. And she's also just started uh, high school. Um, it's noted that she, she has always had difficulties in school um, and barely got by and now grade nine hits. And sometimes that's a big, well, it's obviously a big transition because you go to a different school, it's a different system. You know, normally with outside of COVID, of course, you'd have your own locker and you'd be wandering from class to class. It's not like one teacher's really looking out for you. And it's not like you kind of have some previous history that gets moved into your next class so that your current teacher is kind of aware of what's happened before. You're kind of a brand new person in a brand new environment. And so sometimes things come to light or are exacerbated by that significant transition into high school as it is the case with Olivia here. So her mom has to remind her constantly to do her homework and she's always losing the house keys and she just seems to be kind of vacant and um, it, lots of reminders and uh, it can be frustrating. The mornings are especially difficult because things need to happen quickly to get on the bus and it's just a chore to, to get on the bus and she misses the bus a lot. Okay, so as you can imagine, what ties these cases together is the diagnosis of ADHD, and that stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, that's, the, that's the common name for it. I have a lot of parents asking, saying, hey, there's no hyperactivity. Um, can't we just call this ADD? And I'll get into that in a, a second. There is a bit of you know, variation in, in what we call it, depending on what the key presenting features are. Is it a new thing? Well, no, there's a picture of uh, an old picture of someone named Sir, Sir George Frederick Still. He was, a, he was a famous physician. In fact, there's a, a murmur named after this guy called the Stills murmur, which he discovered, a uh, heart murmur. So um, if you have a little bit of a whooshing sound in your heart and, it's, um, and it's, it's due to one of the tendons that holds your valves together, that's called a Stills murmur. So this is the guy who found that out. But obviously he was also interested in other parts of uh, um, medical care, including more psychological and uh, mental health, because he, he, he wrote about this boy here. You can read his description there. Where he says, another boy, age six years with marked moral defect, was unable to keep his attention even to a game for more than a very short time. And as might be expected, the failure of attention was very noticeable at school, with the result that in some cases, a child was backward in school att attainments. Although in manner and ordinary conversation, he appeared as bright and intelligent as any child could be. So there's a description of a child who's inattentive, who's not focusing, who's disruptive and maybe hyperactive as well, and was, was struggling in school, but kind of in, in other areas and just sort of social functioning, he seemed to be pretty normal. And that's, uh, that's typically the case. So is this, a, is this a new concept? No, people have been talking about this for quite some time. As I mentioned in earlier talks as well, we, we now seem to formalize these diagnoses into a, in, in, in a sort of a psychiatric classification system called the DSM-5 and ADHD is in there. But really that just describes things that have probably been around for centuries. People always ask too, like what about ADHD? You know, was that even there 50 years ago? Yeah, it probably was. And those kids, we just didn't diagnose them. We didn't recognize them. They generally would drop out of school. 
and uh, go fight a war somewhere uh, and, uh, and, and maybe you know, uh, get injured because of their impulsivity and their hyperactivity would get them into trouble and we just never would diagnose them. And, um, uh, and nowadays, of course, we are much more keen to make sure that kids finish their schooling and kids who struggle with attention and focus are gonna fall behind. And whereas we used to fail kids a lot and we used to take more punitive measures in that situation, now we are much more attentive to maybe there's something neurologic or psychological that's underpinning all of that. So what is ADHD? Well, it's a disorder characterized by hyperactivity and impulsivity and attention. Those are the, the two broad categories, all right? And when we do screens for ADHD, we ask for symptoms in that hyperactive impulsive side. So, you know, can't sit still, as if driven by a motor, kind of like the Energizer bunny. Um, you know, they, 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 um, they're constantly moving. They always fidgeting, always have something in their hands. In attention, you know, are they like they're staring off into space? Um, they often lose things and they are forgetful. They need constant reminders. I mean, those are symptoms of inattention that we would ask about. And it, 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 to be a diagnosis, you kind of have to have symptoms that start before the age of 12 and are present in more than one setting. If you're inattentive just at school, but not at home, then you got to start thinking this is probably not a, like a problem that's internal to the child. It's probably something more in the environment. And it's all, oftentimes it's actually both. But you know, it has to be present in more than one environment. It's like diabetes. You can't have diabetes at school and not at home, all right? Um, and, and just the exact same way. Those, those neurotransmitters are, are equally affected at school as they are at home when it's, a, when it's an ADHD diagnosis. Also remember, we talked about this before in the previous sessions. You know, to be a disorder, it has to affect day-to-day -day functioning, all right? You, 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 you can't have a disorder without dysfunction. If you're getting by just fine and your marks are good and you're happy, then why diagnose somebody with a disorder, okay? We don't wanna create problems or pathologize normal behavior. We also don't wanna confuse personality with disorder. Some, some kids, boys especially, tend to be more energetic. They need to move to focus and we should allow them to do that. Um, you know, I've been in meetings too with adults where the adults just need to take a break, stand up and stretch or walk to the back or, or, or just maybe stand up and listen to the, to the meeting that's in progress. You know, we, we allow that. So why can't we allow kids to do that as well? And um, I find sometimes it's, it's, it, there's a push sometimes to pathologize, but it's actually just normal behavior. And some kids' brains just need to move to focus. Nothing wrong with that, right? Just like some kids tend to be a bit more hands-on. That's how they play. That's how they develop that's just a personality and we don't want to make personality into a disorder we want to recognize difference appreciate differences and celebrate differences and leverage it, those differences uh, we don't want to make it more than it needs to be so um, as i mentioned this happens in adults as well as kids and it looks different in children versus adults um, so there is a list of how inattention on the left-hand side there, how inattention presents in children. I've mentioned many of those things already and then how inattention presents in adults. And if you're listening to this talk today, you might look at that list and go, hmm, maybe I'm in that list. Maybe I have difficulty finishing tasks and I often lose things and misplace things. I need, I have no time management skills. I'm constantly jumping from one thing to another and I can't stay concentrated or focused for very long. And, um, and so that's, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe this diagnosis pertains to you. But again, if it's not causing dysfunction, if you're working and your, your family, you know, function is reasonable, then, then maybe it's just part of, you know, your personality. I also hear a lot from families about, well, they can focus on a video game for like hours and hours on end. Well, that's not really a great way to measure attention and focus. Those video games are designed on purpose to keep your focus and attentive like 24, they're meant to be addictive actually. And there are teams of psychologists at work for companies that make video games to purposely make them more addictive and to get you into what's called the flow zone so that you kind of lose perception of time and space around you and you're just in that zone. And before you know it, three or four hours has passed. That is actually, we see more kids with attention and focus difficulties who are drawn towards those kinds of games and uh, as screen and screen time activities, um, and they can be very, 
very, very addictive. And we actually do think now that those kinds of activities online are probably at least in part responsible for the difficulties with attention when it comes to regular day-to-day -day stuff, okay? Because school does not move that quickly. No teacher can compete with a video game in terms of keeping your attention and keeping you like on track, like, and doing these sort of split second uh, changes all the time to keep your focus and attention. So real life moves way slower than video games and even movies. Um, and, I've, and maybe you've noticed this too, movies just seem to move at a much faster pace now than they did 20 years ago. I, I've watched some movies with my kids that I thought that were entertaining when I was their age and they're like falling asleep. It's like too slow. Um, if you look at, you know, Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, I don't know if you ever looked at an episode of Mr. Rogers Neighborhood, but it moves like molasses. It is, it is just slow. And they can spend five minutes on how to set the table. And uh, you compare that to Baby Einstein, where it's like boom, 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 all these you know, quick scene changes. Um, you'll realize that our kids' attention span is probably different now than it was 20 years ago. Um, hyperactivity looks like this, you know, squirming, fidgety, running around, you know, can't play or work quietly, always, like I said, driven on the go, kind of like the Energizer Bunny. And then adults, uh, those are sort of the more adult related symptoms in that same category. And then the impulsivity is sort of, you know, acting before thinking, you just kind of do it. And then, you know, before you realize it, it's like, oh, shoot, that wasn't probably the right thing to do. So we're going to talk in a minute about executive function and how our brain inhibits those impulses most of the time. It's probably a good idea that we don't do what we think immediately all the time. All right. A little bit of a fuse and a little bit of time goes a long way into maintaining your relationships and your day to day function. So we don't Sometimes it's good to be impulsive. When you're running away from a threat or a fear, impulsivity is great. Act before thinking. But if your survival is not at stake, it's probably not a good idea most of the time. So this kind of is a similar concept to what we just showed there that you know the impact of ADHD is different at different ages. Uh, so we have behavioral disturbances in, in preschool. Um, and then in school age, it's academic problems and difficult with social interactions. But in, as, in adolescence, we see that impulsivity, we see increased risk-taking behavior, uh, more involvement with the law, uh, more um, um, prone to addictions and addictive substances, nicotine and other drugs, um, accidents, risky sexual behavior. And then that sort of carries through into adulthood, into occupational difficulties and family and social relationship difficulties uh, as well. So the presentation varies uh, depending on stage of development and the age of the child and what they are doing. Um, there's a lot of adults who can manage their ADHD by gravitating say, towards a career or a job that accommodates for that. If you have attention and focus difficulties, you're probably not gonna become an air traffic controller all right. Um, but there's lots of other things you can do that don't require like, you know, focus and attention. That's, you know, life threatening if you don't pay attention. So um, and, and so, there, so, so what we find is that in high school already, kids kind of gravitate towards what they are like. And, and that can sometimes mitigate some of the more you know, detrimental effects of attention and focus difficulties. Uh, than if we were to choose another occupation that requires those skills to be honed. Talked about this already, increased use of, you know, increased risk of smoking, of, of, of drug use, uh, more likely to be incarcerated. We know that there is a, a high percentage of untreated ADHD in our prison population. Um, and uh, we know that a lot of, you know, um, lives can really get off track because of impulsive and risk, risky decisions. Um, and and, and, and we'll, we'll talk again about this sort of transgenerational trend there as well, because, you know, parents with ADHD uh, might struggle with, you know, um, their own ability to manage the kids and to parent and to really, you know, think things through and to respond in a calm and in maybe kind of less emotional way. 
And so some of those things do get modeled for kids and it just kind of carries on from one generation to the next. And I think that happens a lot in, in um, you know, certain, certain groups and individuals. And uh, so we have to be just cognizant of that as well, that, it's, you know, we can break that cycle. We can help people and kind of get through that and, um, and hopefully have subsequent generations benefit from that as well. Okay. Um, I talk about driving a little bit too, you know, I just always mentioned about teenagers and driving and I look at some kids who are really inattentive and I'm like, okay, like we <laughs> probably don't want to be driving on the 400 with somebody who's not fo focused and paying attention. And, you know, you think of the number of distractions there are now, texting, videos, people eating in their car, like the opportunity for distraction is there and the risk of an accident at speeds that we're currently driving uh, is much greater. Fortunately, cars are safer in general and we're wearing seatbelts more, but um, you know, if there's inattention and, and lack of focus when a, when a teenager especially is driving, um, if they have ADHD, you'd want that to be managed properly. I keep coming back to this. Um, there's a cute little baby, of course. It's like, uh, I don't know, I'm gonna guess that's about 14 weeks or so gestation. Um, and just talk again about brain development and brain growth. Um, we know now and uh, that there's this concept of sort of top, sorry, sorry, bottom up development of the nervous system that starts like at minus nine months before you're born. So right from a conception and early you know, formation of uh, the, the baby's brain, um, right from the very beginning, we see first sort of that, you know, that, that lower brain stem and then that mid brain, and then the area called the limbic system, which includes your hippocampus, your amygdala, and then that then um, branches out into eventually the cortex or the outer part of the brain. And that's where our executive function skills come from, our ability to plan, coordinate, finish tax, uh, tasks, uh, maybe finish our taxes too, but finish tasks and, um, and inhibit certain you know, impulses. Uh, that all comes from that prefrontal cortex. And that is the last to develop. And the reason I say that is because, you know, when there are stressors and toxins and insults that happen to brain development early on, especially during sensitive periods, um, you know, in like, for example, fetal alcohol spectrum is, this, you know, alcohol at, at early in pregnancy, the first trimester particularly is, is toxic. And that's why we see fetal alcohol spectrum to you know, if, um, when, when babies have been exposed to alcohol in the first trimester and we see the effects of that when they're born. And because brain development was affected, that's a very sensitive period during that first trimester to alcohol specifically. But those stressors, those stress hormones can happen whenever they're stressed towards mom who's pregnant, but then after the baby's born towards the child, him or herself. So the, the toxic hormones that are produced by stress really affect brain development. And so, yes, we get that nice, you know, the, the brainstem might form, the child's heart beats and breathes. Um, and, you know, the, the, the midbrain might form. So we have the, you know, the impulsivity, the fight flight response is there because, you know, that's, that's part of that midbrain. But then the connections to that, outer part of the brain where our, where our executive functions come from, those could ser be seriously impaired. And so those kids can also present with symptoms that are consistent with ADHD, difficulty with self-regulation, difficulty with emotional regulation, difficulty with their executive function skills, all right? Th those, are, those are things we see in kids whose brain development has been you know, under stress and exposed to various conditions and, and, and substances perhaps um, that, can, that, that affect that child's brain development. And so that is most critical in those first few years of life, all right? And it's interesting to note that because you'd think that that's where we would put all of our resources when it comes to mental health and public health and you know, the social determinants of health. 
if we can get kids so through the first five years of life in a, in a healthy, productive, supportive environment, boy, we'd be preventing a huge amount of problems 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road. Look at that graph there on the right. I mean, the brain expands, it almost triples in size uh, in those first few years of life. Your brain is forming about, uh, about um, a million neuronal connections per second when you're a baby, okay? Just, it's mind boggling. So even while we were talking, there were, a baby would have formed like almost a billion neuronal connections. The brain is so complicated. We're gonna talk about this again next, uh, tomorrow actually, when we talk about developmental trauma and uh, a little bit as well on Friday when we talk about collaborative problem solving um, uh, as well. But I just, wanted to, I just wanted to highlight it again today that you know um, a lot of kids could be diff struggling with focus and attention because there was a lot of stress uh, early on, adverse childhood experiences early on, uh, even before they were born. There, there is that executive function part of the brain that I was just talking about. Uh, you know, a nice little picture of the brain there. That's the, like if you were to get a model of the brain on those little plastic things, they would look like that. And you can see all those squirmy, wormy things are, are the outer, side, outer part of the brain, the cortex, we call that. Um, and, um, and then uh, we have the, the frontal cortex there. We've got the amygdala, which is where your more, you know, stress responses come from, your aggressiveness can come from there. And it's called amygdala because it's the almond shape, it's like Latin for almond. And then the hippocampus is just kind of around there, also very deep inside the brain that does a, that does a lot of like emotional regulation. So they all connect with each other. And those connections have to be established for, for the frontal cortex to, to work properly and to help with planning, self-regulating, staying on task, impulsivity, and, um, and manage your reactions you know, in the split second. Uh, sometimes we have to inhibit those, as I was mentioning before. So you look at that list, you're like, hey, that looks like ADHD symptoms. Yes, ADHD is really, when it comes right down to it, is difficulty with your executive function skills that arise from that front part of the brain, okay? So that, that's, if you wanted to sort of get as much neurobiology involved as possible, that's really all there is to it. That front part of the brain is not doing its job and is leading to day-to-day -to -day dysfunction. So if we can improve our executive function skills, we're gonna make, um, we're gonna make some headway. So how can we improve those? Well, uh, of course, we can try and prevent some of these stressors in early development. You know, if we can support families so that you know stress is reduced in those early years, if we can provide you know um, uh, ch child care, uh, you know less worry about medical conditions, um, you know if we can make sure that uh, you know families are are feeling secure financially and emotionally, we can provide help for parents, early year centers all those societal things we can do help to reduce stress and are gonna pay dividends, like I said, decades down the road, not just with physical health, so sorry, not just with mental health, but also with physical health. So that's very important. Mindfulness, we should, you know, in class, we should be doing reading, writing, arithmetic, and the fourth R, regulation, right? I know those aren't all, all R's, but we talk about the three R's, you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic. I know it's I still don't get that, but still. And then regulation would be like the fourth R. We should be teaching kids right from kindergarten how to regulate their emotions. There are programs in school that do this. There are zones of regulation. Um, there are probably others out there that I just can't think of right now, but you know, there's lots of ways that we can teach kids to recognize, okay, you know, I'm, I'm getting angry, or I'm getting upset. Okay, how, what do I do? Like, take a break, use your language, you know, uh, calm yourself down, do some breathing, slow down your heart rate. Like, those are just life skills and that are just as important as learning how to read. So the more we can support kids in, in managing their own mental health that way, start at an early age, make it just a normal part of, of school. Um, that is as vital as any of those other R's. Um, Trauma, so this goes back to point number one. So trauma is essentially, you know, stress that we're unable to cope with. And uh, if kids are exposed to traumatic experiences and adverse conditions, and that's gonna affect their executive functioning skills. So again, we need to address issues of, of child abuse and neglect. Um, we need to address, you know, 
untreated mental health conditions in parents that are traumatic for kids, domestic violence, all those things can really be huge stressors for kids. And then again, uh, using that bottom-up approach to the brain, using movement, using exercise, using physical activity, so good for kids. Uh, it just reduces, it, it releases all these natural endorphins and healthy neurotransmitters that just have positive effects on brain development as well. Um, you know, we've lots of hyperactive kids that just need an outlet, that just need to like burn off some energy, get them involved in the sports, get them running, get them active. I know lots of athletes who have ADHD diagnosis and if they can just kind of get out on the bike or go for a run or play that game or go play hockey, you know, they, they do just great. So um, that's a very important part of a holistic approach. And then in classrooms, we should have some accommodations for kids that struggle with attention. We, we need to be able to maybe write down instructions for them, give them extra time to complete certain activities, um, you know, just allow them to move, to fidget sometime, maybe take a break, go for a walk. There's lots of things we can incorporate into a day. We don't need to be as rigid and structured with every, where every child, we just think every child learns the same way. No, every kid's different. The more we can accommodate that and, and, and work towards a child's strengths, the better. Every kid's can be at a slightly different level, all right? And one thing we'll talk about on Friday when we talk about collaborative problem solving is that you know whenever there's a gap between a child's abilities and our expectations, there's gonna be behavior, it's guaranteed. So if we can bring a child's abilities um, and our expectations more in line, then we're gonna see success. We're gonna see kids succeeding more, positive experiences. I mentioned before, positive experiences beget more positive experiences. So the more we can close that gap and have a child's abilities match our expectations. I mean, you wanna challenge them a little bit. You don't wanna make things too easy. You want to make it just right so that you're right in that well that's called the zone of proximal development for that child and then they will be successful and you'll see behavior diminish markedly when you can close that gap uh and then medication i mean every talk about medication every always comes and says i don't want my kid on ritalin okay all right um we i don't use ritalin anymore but i use medications like that i mean stimulants are still the first line treatment for adhd when You've tried other things and, you're, and the child's still struggling. Sometimes we'll recommend medication. As I mentioned in all my other talks as well, like that's always a decision that um, is never an easy one. Nobody kind of you know, sets out to have their child on any sort of medication to help them function. But think about it. I mean, if the trade-off is a lot of negative experience and dysfunction, and you know, that's going to affect the course of life hugely, uh, versus taking medication and having more positive experience, being able to control the impulses and and the hyperactivity and the lack of focus, and then that you know yields to more successful relationships and you know improved behavior and improved learning. Well, then you know those are that the pros of that. So that might outweigh then the risk and side effects of any medication. So sometimes we do we do go that route. We uh, we tend to, stimulants, like I said, are still the first line. Most study been been around for decades. Ritalin used to be used more commonly, but because it's so short acting, we tend to use more long acting stimulants right now. I I don't remember the last time I prescribed Ritalin. It's always a long acting form of of that medication. There's a couple of different types of stimulants out there, each with their pros and cons, which. You know, I, if there's any questions about that, I can try and answer that. But I mean, there's so many things we could talk about there. Uh, they all, the main side effects are difficulty with falling asleep. If you're, you know, if you have the medication still in your system by the end of the day, they're all designed to wear off by the end of the day so that your appetite picks up because that's the other side effect. It can decrease appetite. So um, we need to make sure it's out of the system you know by the by the early evening so that we do have a good supper and dinner maybe bedtime snack to make up for some lost calories during the day and uh, and that the child's able to fall asleep having said that many kids with adhd report sleeping difficulty even before starting stimulants so we can't just always say oh that's the stimulants fault uh it might be some other sleep difficulty related to anxiety or hyperactivity that um will get better once the adhd is treated in fact there's some good studies out there now that show that when ADHD is actually properly treated, sleep actually improves. 
All right. So just be aware of that to not kind of assign everything to uh, to a medication side effect. There could be other reasons for it, especially if the difficulty precedes the initiation of medication. And then it's also non stimulants out there. You know, they generally are not as efficacious as the stimulants. But sometimes, if we have too many side effects with the stimulants, we might have to go to a non stimulant medication. Different set of side effects, but generally, you know, side effects are better with the non stimulants, but the efficacy is not as great. So you kind of have to trade that off. Sometimes they're added in with, with a stimulant. Um, and these ones generally last uh, 24 hours per day. So that's kind of nice too. Sometimes we see huge problems in the morning uh, before a stimulant has kicked in uh, or in the evening when we are purposely wanting the stimulant to be worn off. So that's why sometimes a non-stimulant medication can be a nice option as well. Um, you know, people do ask a lot about other natural type remedies. You know, there's, it's, Maybe there's some benefits to like, you know, reducing sugar in a diet. I think the main benefit there is that you're just eating healthier in general. That's going to be helpful. Uh, red dyes comes up all the time. Not really huge amount of evidence, you know, for we're trying to remove red dyes. In fact, sometimes a bit of a risk when, you, when the diet becomes too restrictive because you're trying to avoid so many things. You know, I have kids who are on like gluten-free, dairy-free, red dye-free, sugar-free. I'm like, well, what's left? And um, so we have to be careful that we don't become too restrictive in a child's diet because that can have uh, impact as well, negative impact as well. Um, but um, yeah, that's, so that's, um, I think that's, that's to deal with, uh, with medications and, and uh, pharmacotherapy. Uh, some resources, um, uh, these are Canadian websites, have lots of information about ADHD. So the, uh, the CADRA, um, the AD, which is the Canadian ADHD, ADD Resource Alliance and CADAC, unfortunately very similar sounding acronyms, but CADAC is a Canadian ADD Awareness Center. It has lots of resources for parents and for teachers and professionals. Um, some good books, there's probably hundreds out there, but uh, Dr. Barkley's book is very, very well known. He, I, and that's just one of his books, he's written like 20. Uh, and then Gabor Mate is a well-known writer about all things um, mental health related. And that's written a great book called Scattered Mind, which also this actually describes his experience with ADHD. He's been diagnosed with it himself. And so it's good to get a firsthand perspective like that. There's, again, there's many other books out there. And I just realized now I was supposed to find some autism books and I forgot to do that between now and yesterday. So I apologize for that. That's all I have. Um, I wonder if there's maybe any, any questions. So what I'll do is I will stop sharing my screen, which, um, there we go. And just stop share right there. Okay. Just see if there's any. Um... I do have one. Okay. Yes, Julie. Um, Julie, yes. So my daughter's four and a half. Um, she was diagnosed last year with ADHD combined type. Um, we live in Penetang. Actually, I work at Chagamek. I'm just working off site today. <laughs> um, anyways, um, she is currently on Risperidone, and I'm not 100% sure it's working. So we're just trying to figure out meds with pediatrician in the next month or so. My question is, because now that you're with Waypoint, um, mm. uh, to transfer her care because it's just a, so essential to even have it locally. It cannot be done, or how would that work? Yeah, so this is a big issue, and you know, this is not just related to ADHD, but general pediatric mental yeah. health. Yeah. As you know, uh, resources are scarce, and um, that's what we're trying to change here, actually, by mm -hmm. by getting this um, program started here at Waypoint. And um, so, as of Two weeks ago, um, you know, I'm not a medical director of child youth mental health, but so far I'm the only person here. So we're working on improving that. That is a that is a strategic priority. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, hopefully that will improve. My 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 I am already inundated by by consultation requests, as you can imagine. I've been found. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, and so generally, what I would say is, if you have a pediatrician, I would say stick with that pediatrician for now. But, you know, it's worth a discussion. Um, Risperidone is, it was not on a list of medication I'd that I'd recommended for ADHD because it's yep. 
not really on the ADHD list of medications. It's more for other issues. Mm -hmm. So there may be parts of the story that um, you haven't been able to share, but you know, generally ADHD first line is always stimulants. And, but even for behavior regulation difficulties, yep. if, if there's not strict criteria for ADHD, you know, the stimulants may work for that. I usually tend to try them first because those medications like stimulants have less side effects than risperidone. But at a young age, like you mentioned four and a half, that's mm -hmm. pretty young. So that's going to require a more detailed discussion than we're able to have on the online here today. Yeah. But I would say for now, I mean, um, unfortunately, my weight list is growing at an exponential rate. I would mm -hmm. say if you got a pediatrician, stick with your pediatrician for now. Down mm -hmm. the road, there might be more opportunity to have more local follow-up. Um, but I, right now it's pretty limited. I'm, I'm following about almost 600 patients actively. Oh. Right now. now she does have ODD with the ADHD. I think that's kind of where the psychiatrist was going, but we noticed as she's getting older, she's regulating, but, um, so obviously that's more age related as well with the aggressive and the emotional aspect. So we find that that's getting better, but the hyperactivity, like that's where the change in medication needs to come. Yes. So, okay. What do you recommend? Well, because, because, you know, four to six years, yeah. that's pretty young. I, like, normally we don't make an ADHD diagnosis until the kid is six. Yeah. We know that a lot of those self-regulation skills still need to kick in between before the age of six. Yeah. So we're careful not to label and assign too many diagnoses before the age of six. Yeah. It's much more beneficial to talk just about self-regulation difficulties as opposed to an ADHD diagnosis when you're dealing with young kids, preschool kids. There is a big push to get kids diagnosed with ADHD before school starts. I'm not a huge fan of that because, mm -hmm. and even ODD diagnosis, I mean, I don't like the ODD diagnosis personally that much because it just almost puts the blame on the child for their behavior when in fact, it's just more around limited skill development yeah, than sure. intentional, you know, misbehavior even though it can look that way these kids mm -hmm. do push our buttons sometimes um but uh, whether I, I find the odd diagnosis can be a little bit direct attention away from the the brain issue the problem and more towards like hey you're just a problem child that we're gonna have to try and you know fix or yeah. and and so that's a whole other discussion and they probably <laughs> would take a long time to yeah. figure that out and, and that's worth the discussion with your pediatrician as well but Maybe down the road, there will be capacity. We, we want to improve and increase capacity here mm -hmm. at uh, waypoints. I'm hoping that I could give you a better answer, say even a year from now than, uh, than I am currently. Okay, that's good. And I'll just take a walk over in the near yeah. in the future. Oh, no, thanks yeah. you for your question. Uh, there's a couple other uh, questions here on the side here. My son is ADHD. What can I do to help him enjoy school more? Um, yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Like I said, negative experience at school, just beget more negative experiences. And then suddenly we have decreased self-esteem, decreased self-confidence. Kids just resist going to school. And then that just sets up a whole other dynamic in the family, school avoidance, et cetera. So um, I think the first thing to do is, like I said, at the, at the end there, make sure that the school knows and that you know that we don't have a huge gap there between ability and expectations. And so if expectations are always up here, you're gonna get a chronically failing child. And so, um, so it's, just, it's just important that we recognize that gap. And if that gap's there, no kid's gonna enjoy school. So the school needs to be on board and we need to, you know, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what age your son is, that makes a big difference too, but obviously uh, the school, they need to be modified if, if the child does not enjoy school. Go to those websites, CAD or CADAC, and for more information on that. Second question, does screen time have an impact on ADHD? Is it true that allowing children under two to watch TV or use tablets can cause ADHD? I, well, I talked a little bit about that as well. There's more and more evidence that attention and the attention pathways are affected neurologically by too much screen time. And we, so less screen time is better. There has been no family that's come up to me when their kids are in high school, whatever, saying like, man, I wish we had introduced screens sooner in our kids. I wish we had done it when they were two. Not a single family. Every family is the opposite. It's like, I wish we would have held off a little bit longer. Kids do will not fall, up, fall behind with their screen time knowledge and skills. If we wait a few years, they'll catch on plenty quick, okay? Those tablets and, and, and such are easy to use and they're intuitive. Uh, you, your child is not going to miss out by not being on a screen 
for the first few years of their life. So the CPS, the Canadian Pediatric Society screen time guidelines do talk about no screens before the age of two. Um, there is no benefit to baby Einstein, uh, even Sesame Street. You know, it's great for maybe the older kids to help complement some skills, but it really for the younger kids, no screens. No screens, I mean, if you need to have something on in the background while you're doing another errand quickly or whatever, that's fine. You know, but be very reasonable about it and be informed that, that it is not, there's no educational value in screens or screen time. Are there day-to-day -day changes we can make to help my child learn to focus more? Day-to-day uh, -day change, again, pretty, pretty vague question in the sense of like, that's going to vary from kid to kid and from family to family, but um, uh, yeah, I mean, just again, manage, manage screen time, um, sleep. So just be sure your child's getting enough sleep, uh, especially with COVID, sleep times all got pushed back. Every sleep, everybody's bedtime, you know, got pushed, pushed later and later. So make sure that that gets back on track. If a child's not sleeping, they're not going to be less focused and more irritable during the day. So that's one big thing I talk about a lot. The other one is exercise. So if kids are getting exercise, they're able to focus better during the day. So I'm a huge fan of daily physical activity in schools, any schools that eliminate that or that reduce recess or unstructured play uh, during the day is they're gonna see a, a deficit uh, in, in functioning adolescents and adults down the road. The term ADHD seems to be used very widely, sometimes without diagnosis. Yep, I agree. Um, are there common misconceptions about ADHD? Is this liberal use of the term ADHD problematic for those who actually struggle with ADHD? Yeah, and that's why in general, I, I just don't, I mean, I'm, I, I'm for diagnoses when they're helpful and when they can get your resources, but I, I always like to take more of a problem-based or difficulty-based approach to especially children's mental health. What is the actual problem here? Let's just Forget about the names and the, and the letters and the diagnosis. Like, what's the problem and what can we do about it? Um, you know, yes, there are some legitimate diagnoses that we need to recognize. And, and, you know, you need a diagnosis to get certain resources and get help and to get, you know, some, some, some assistance with it. But, you know, in general, like, let's just focus on where are the actual difficulties. And if we can help with that, you know, diagnosis can disappear too. Um, and sometimes, you know, developmentally, something makes a lot of sense when a kid is four or five or six, and then you see them a few years later, and you're like, that doesn't apply anymore. We've, come, we've overcome that with whatever we uh, approach. So, you know, I do think that it's important to, you know, provide a legitimate diagnosis when it's useful and helpful. Um, but I like more to focus on, on, the, on the actual difficulties. Misconception about ADHD, you know, the probably the biggest misconception is that some of that behavior is intentional and purposeful, that kids are just trying to push your buttons and seeking attention and, and misbehaving uh, for more vindictive reasons. That's why I don't like that ODD diagnosis as much because it, it actually it uses the word vindictive when it talks about a child's behavior. Um, so oppositional defined disorder is what ODD stands for, by the way. But ADHD in general, um, you know, there are some misconceptions out there around, you know, the motivation behind the behavior that we see. And we're gonna talk about this on Friday. we we'll talk about collaborative problem solving, but in general, kids will do well if they can. And so um, if we give the kids the skills, the behavior will improve. Um, anyways, um, last question, what's your recommendation to parents of children with ADHD in terms of video game time? Yeah, so video games in moderation. I mean, I don't think you need to completely delete video games and from a child's life. Sometimes a fast is, is nice, a technology fast to kind of reconnect. Um, but um, kids with ADHD, you know, they're going to gravitate towards those games and those video games. So it's, it has a potential to be highly addictive. So I would treat it like you would any addictive substance, you know, uh, be careful with it and um, limits, definitely limit screen time use and set some clear parameters around that, always collaboratively if you can. Unilateral solutions in, with kids rarely stick, right? If the kids are part of the solution, then things are gonna work. Again, this is a preamble to my Friday talk, so don't miss that one. 
Okay, I think we'll leave it at that. Um, I thank you for joining and I look forward to seeing you tomorrow at a different time.